has muted stone. Good afternoon, ma'am Shudipta and all the boys. You Good are afternoon. Uh, yes. Okay. Am I uh, audible? Uh, now audible. Ma'am Shudipta, vote of thanks you will give? No, no. I am not going to give the vote of thanks. I don't know. Who who I don't Sir. know, ma'am. Third knows. Let, let me ask. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome to DBL. We are waiting for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Am I visible? Yes, you are visible, Tanish. Yes, ma'am. A way of life, a perspective, a feeling that takes you 
from confusion <coughs> to understanding in a manner that is precise, predictive, and reliable, and empowering an emotional transformation for those fortunate enough to experience it. That is what science is. A very good afternoon to Father Rector, Father Principal, our Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Devi Prashad Duari, all the teachers, and to all the talented young minds delving into the depths of learning. I take hold of this opportunity to welcome each one of you to the second and final day of Don Bosco School Lilua's annual science exhibition, Oceanus Cognitionis 2K22. Science has been instrumental in man's path of evolution, be it diving into the depths of the ocean or exploring the horizons of space and beyond. Science knows no limits. Keeping that in mind, we at Don Bosco Lelua are hosting the first ever online edition of our annual science exhibition. The wonders of science are beyond what anyone can expect. It delves into the domain of the unknown, fishing out strange and unexpected happenings. We shall now witness a short video presentation, which is a collection of some of these wonders of science.
I am sure that the video presentation must have left all of you awestruck and amazed. I feel extremely privileged to tell the audience that we have Dr. Devi Prashad Duwari in our midst today as our chief guest. I would now request Ma'am Sujitha Chaudhary to introduce her to the audience. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon to Sir also. On behalf of DBL, I take this immense pleasure to welcome our today's guest of honor, Dr. Devi Prasad Duwari, amidst us. We welcome you, sir. Dr. Duwari is presently the director, research and academic of MP Billa Institute of Fundamental Research at MP Billa Planetarium, Kolkata. He is also the honorary faculty of physics department in Presidency College. Dr. Duwari graduated and postgraduated in physics from Jadapur University and pursued his PhD from Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. He was a postdoctoral fellow of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He was associated with a number of distinguished academic institutions, including Institute for Advanced Studies in Iran, University of Cambridge in UK, and Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, UK. He is a fellow of Royal Astronomical Society and a member of International Astronomical Union. He has also received the best thesis award of the Astronomical Society of India in the year 1993-94. Not only this, he is also the receiver of Rabindra Purushkar from Government of West Bengal in 2019 for literary achievement in science. We hope, sir, that our boys get enlightened and enriched interacting with you today. And once again, we give you a hearty welcome. Thank you for your presence that you have found out from your busy schedule to enrich our boys. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. It's really a wonderful feeling for me that uh, I have got this invitation to discuss, to talk with the young minds about the subject area, which today has become quite exciting, interesting, and important as well. First and foremost, I wish all the success to Ron Bosco Ligua, especially the science exhibition, and hope this science exhibition will start off new ideas, new concept, new focus among the young minds. Because as the human race is developing, we are realizing that science and technology is the only two main pillars which can be contributing to our developments of the society, of the human civilization, and of our mind as well. So science has become a very, very oft-quoted universal word. It is not just a subject as taught in a school curriculum. Any aspect of life, even if it is fine arts, humanities, science has made inroads in that. Or rather, we have realized the importance of science in each of these subject areas. So that is the reason we have to first understand what is science. As I mentioned, it's not a subject. It is the way of life. That I'm speaking to you, and at least 100, 120 people or 124 people are actually logged on to this digital platform, seeing this thing, listening to this, that I'm alive 72 times per minute, my heart is beating, that my blood is flowing from one part of my body to the other part, taking away the electrochemical signals and other informations. That itself tells you that, that we are here because we have to understand science is behind everything. Science makes us analytical, logical, it doesn't depend on fanaticism. It doesn't depend on biases. It doesn't depend on prejudices. It doesn't depend on imagination. Rather, it depends on facts, realities, observations, experiments, and how nature works. So every young mind 
whatever may be his profession after 10, 15, 20 years, should have this logical bent of mind, should have a scientific outlook, should have a scientific temper, which is demanded even in our Indian constitution. So that is the reason and my personal feeling is that one of the best ways to understand the nature in its grandest scale through our understanding of science, that is astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, that is one of the best areas to excite young minds. I will today deliver a webinar basically through a PowerPoint presentation. So if you allow me some 15, 30 seconds, I will share my screen and the PowerPoint. If you can kindly tell me, somebody, can you see the slide? Yes, sir, your screen is visible. Okay. So basically, the topic of my discussion today is about a subject area, not a specific pointed idea or concepts. That's why the name, Concepts and Challenges in Astronomy and Astrophysics. Thousands of years back, when our ancestors used to look into the sky, they used to wonder, what is sky? Where is sky? What are those lighted dots we call stars? And is there any connection between the star and the earth? With these set of questions and queries, the subject of astronomy was born. So astronomy can be considered as one of the most old subjects in human civilization. It can also be considered as one of the most contemporary or recent subject here. It is a subject that deals with vast expanse of space and time, and it unfolds the mysteries of universal nature. Just to impress upon you the importance of this subject as the days goes by, starting from 1901 till 2000, only three and a half Nobel Prizes were given to scientists who have worked on astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, general theory of relativity and relativity. Whereas from 2000 to 2020, six Nobel Prize, 17 Nobel laureates were given the Nobel Prize for work in astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. 2020 was the most recent one. Three scientists, they got the Nobel Prize for their studies, observations of black holes. If you're interested to know which of the subject area, there is an amazing answer to that. Almost every branch of science, every branch of science and technology, mathematics, physics, statistics, chemistry, biology, computer science, and engineering. So that means anybody who is pursuing his career, his studies in these fields, in the later part of his life, he can meaningfully contribute towards research, studies, teaching in astronomy and astrophysics. The night sky. Thousands of years back, when our ancestors used to look into the night sky, they used to wonder, what is the meaning behind those lighted dots? But they couldn't find an answer. In their desperation, what they did, they chose different parts of the sky, identified closely space stars, joined those stars through straight lines, and created imaginary figures. In this way, the whole sky was divided into 88 regions, each region being governed by an imaginary figure, which we today call Tara Mandal or constellations. But you may ask the question that these are all imaginary. Why should I know their names or the relative positions? If, we, if you ask me, I will say, even today, they have not lost their physical relevance. Just to give you an example, suppose a batch of you has gone for a hitchhiking trip. Moon is not there in the sky. It is quite dark. You have lost your way. Somebody in the morning has told you that if you go in the southern direction, there is a locality. But which is the southern direction? If you happen to see the Shaptar Shimandal, the big deeper as it is called in the Western parlance, take the last two stars, join them in your mind, produce it under the sky, it will hit up on a single star, and that star is the pole star. The moment you get to know the pole star, you know which is not south or east and west. So you see, even today, these sort of signs and signatures, imaginary, can be helpful for us. And that is the reason also about this importance of this subject. Every country, developed, fully developed, underdeveloped, developing, 
they are desperately trying to build newer and newer facilities, bigger and bigger telescopes, because they have realized the country which will be the first to understand the deepest part of the cosmos will probably win the race in trying to answer the very basic fundamental questions about nature in science. Just to give you an idea, in this very inhospitable region of the coldest desert in the Atacama in Chile, very large telescopes, 8,000 feet above the mean sea level, four gigantic telescopes in La Paranal in Chile. Mauna Kea, a small Hawaiian archipelago island, 14,000 feet above the mean sea level, 15 countries have built 12 telescopes. The smallest one cost is $300 million. So that tells you what a gigantic amount of effort, money, manpower, resources is going behind observing the skies. And not only in optical, radio telescopes, because only the optical and radio wavelengths from a distant object, celestial object, can reach the Earth. The other waves of the electromagnetic spectrum gets mostly deflected or absorbed by the atmosphere. So just like a small telescope or a big telescope which looks into the sky with optical light and radio, you can see for yourself this tremendously large size of a telescope in general Bank in UK near Cheshire. And I used to be very close to that. I have visited this place quite a number of times. It is close to Manchester, basically. But you'll be happy to know the largest telescope is not yet born. The work has started in 2018. By 2024, 2025, probably it will get finished. The world's largest telescope is called TMT, 30 meter telescope, a, a telescope with a 30 meter diameter mirror at the heart of it. The cost of building this telescope is so large, not a single country is able to do it. USA, Canada, Japan, China, Yes, India is one of the most proud associates of this TMT project. Our Prime Minister has declared in the Lok Sabha in 2018, the Indian contribution for building this telescope will be 1,700 crore rupees. Just imagine. Not only that, in 1915, 16, Albert Einstein gave a lot of concept theories, totally new. He said, as you have shown in the video, time and space cannot be separated we live in a four-dimensional space-time. If you now visualize space and time as a rubber membrane, put an object on that membrane because of its mass to go down a little bit, you get deformed. If you put a bigger object, it will go down much, much more. So the curvature created by different objects of different mass tells the smaller objects how to approach the bigger object. And that is gravity. So Isaac Newton's universal laws of gravity actually failed at mere objects which are very massive or has a lot of gravitational potential. Einstein, as a result of the Einstein's theory, people found out that if two very heavy, very compact objects are going round each other, spiraling round each other, they will create a ripple in the space-time called gravitational wave. And in 2015-16, this gravitational wave was discovered by two fantastic laboratories in the US called LIGO, laser, Interferometric Gravitational Observatory. And we'll be happy to know India is the first international associate of the LIGO project and is building its own gravitational wave observatory called Indigo in Maharashtra. And you all know, <clears throat> two weeks back, tremendous amount of excitement, publicity, popularity about the James Webb Space Telescope which promises to be 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. In the last 30 years, Hubble has opened up the universe for our understanding, for our vision, for our, for our amazement. James Webb Space Telescope, hopefully in the coming 10 years, will tell us much more deeper about the universe. Sun, moon, and the earth. The first thing that comes to your mind, these are all kindergarten stuff. Why should I tell you now? But I have seen a lot of people, even aged people, educated people, teachers, when a kid asks them, what is the average velocity of the earth around the sun? They start scratching their head or just try to Google it. 29.5 kilometers per second. Imagine a car in one second moving 30 kilometers. 
you'll say, no, it's not possible at all. But you're forgetting you, me, 7.8 billion people and millions of other forms of life existing on the surface of the earth. Every second of our existence, we are moving at a velocity of 30 kilometers per second. Though you are thinking that you're sitting tight at your chair and I'm thinking, I'm sitting tight at my home. Amazing. I also wanted to impress upon you a understanding, a realization that I had quite early in my studies of astronomy. I realized that though we consider ourselves to be very powerful, either muscle or intelligence or money or political connections, that I am here, I'm so arrogant. But all of us, every form of life exists on earth because of a series of chance accidents. I will tell you why. And that tells us, instead of being arrogant, very sure about ourselves, very proud, we should also be humble because we are here because of an accidental existence. And this is what I call cosmic consciousness. Cosmic consciousness doesn't mean the writings in the Quran, the Vedas, religious, spiritual feelings. Cosmic consciousness means the understanding of our relationship with the cosmos. For example, take the earth and the sun. Earth is going around the sun once in 365.25 days. But it appears to us as if sun is going around the earth in one complete year. Why? Because since the sky is just a two-dimensional surface, along with <clears throat> line of sight, a particular day I will see the sun projected on a particular spot on the sky. The next day, the next day, the next month, as I'm going around, every day the sun will appear at a different point on the sky. And I will realize in one year as I'm going around the sun, it appears to us as if sun is going around the earth on an imaginary great circle once in one year. And this is called the ecliptic. Now, if you consider the earth, take the equator, in your mind, produce it under the sky. On the sky, it will create a great circle and let us call it the celestial equator. You have again studied maybe in your LKG 1, LKG 2 days, that earth is going around the sun around an axis and it goes around itself once in 24 hours around another axis. And these two axes are not parallel, they're inclined at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. But a lot of our teachers have failed to tell us in our childhood days, just because they're inclined and not parallel, you people are sitting at your home, I'm sitting here, billions of people, human beings, billion forms of life exist on the surface of the earth. If these two axes are parallel, there would have been no life on earth. I'll come to that. First accident, tilt. Now, since this, these two axes are inclined to one another, two imaginary planes, the blue colored celestial equatorial plane and the yellow colored ecliptic plane, they will be inclined to one another at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. As a result, they will intersect each other along an imaginary line on space. The endpoints of this imaginary line is a little importance. The first endpoint is called the point of vernal equinox. The word equinox comes from Latin. It means equal nights. 21st or 22nd of March, sun appears at this point. That day it is exactly equal amount of daytime everywhere on Earth. March, April, May, 21st or 22nd of June, sun appears at this point. That day for the Northern Hemisphere people, it is the shortest, longest day and the shortest night. 22nd September, sun comes on the other extreme point, equal amount of daytime and nighttime. And 21st or 22nd of December, sun comes on the southernmost point. That day it is the shortest day and the longest night, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. So this continuous variation of daytime and nighttime on which our biological clock is actually hooked on happens because of this accidental tilt of 23 and a half degrees. Sunlight, if it falls directly onto a patch of land, the average energy per unit area, which will be absorbed and re-radiated, will have a value. If the same beam of light falls slantingly over a bigger patch of land, since the area is more, the average energy per unit area, which will be absorbed and re-radiated, will have a smaller value. As a result, the temperature will be more in the first phase than the second. And that is the simple reason season changes of personal. You see this diagram, when Earth is on one side because of the tilt, sunlight is falling directly onto the north and slanting onto the south. It is summer in the north, winter in the south. Six months later, it is just the opposite. 
because of the tilt, sunlight falling directly onto the south, it is summer in the south and winter in the north. So season changes occur because of this accidental tilt of 23 and a half degrees. But you will say, what is so important about it? Do you know if there were no change of seasons, what would have happened? If there were no change of seasons, there would have been no ocean currents. If there are no ocean currents, there would have been no air currents in our atmosphere. And if there are no air currents in our atmosphere, clouds would not have born somewhere and gathered somewhere else and gave us rain and fresh water. Life would not have been possible because just after Earth was born, it would have been a barren desert. So you and me exist now, remember, because of this accidental tilt, not because of my mutual funds or LICs or your parents' richness or whatever. No. It is just because of sheer accidents. Total solar eclipse, you all know why, what, why it happens. One side sun, middle is the moon, one side earth. Sun's rays falling onto the moon, moon shadow falling onto a patch of space on earth. And people staying on that patch of space at that point of time will see as if the sun has vanished. Beautiful image, right? One of the most beautiful image that nature can provide us. But it was during an eclipse, sun was discovered as a new avatar. They found out from the surface of the sun every second, 16 lakh tons or 1.6 million tons of charged particles are coming. <clears throat> These charged particles, when they move through the magnetic field of the sun, they produce a milky white radiation which cannot be seen on other planets. The average velocity of these charged particles are 450 to 600 kilometers per second. With that speed, they have enough momentum enough energy, if they hit any atom or molecule, instantaneously they will break apart, evaporate, poof. That means <clears throat> if I stop my lecture today and just go and stand on the sun, the charged particle coming from the surface of the sun, the moment they hit my body, within fraction, fraction of a second, my whole body should disintegrate. But I am alive. How? I will come to that. Tides, a very, very, very important phenomenon. Because you have all studied in your class three, class four days, life first occurred on oceans. So how did it come onto the land? Suddenly it grew lakes and climbed onto the land. Every day, high tides used to wash ashore multicellular organisms. The water used to go down after some time. They used to get stranded on the land and used to get killed. But over millions of years, they got, the, got the adaptation of staying alive on land. And from there, different animals, mammals, reptiles occurred, monkeys arrived, and we have arrived from the monkeys. So that we are here because tides are there. If I ask you the question, why does tide occur? You can all say, because of the moon's gravitational attraction. But my friend, if you do a GM on him, M1, M2 by R square calculation, you can show sun is attracting earth 173 times more than the moon does. Then why do you say it is moon which is attracting? Because tide is not a force. It is rather a force derivative. Effect of quite a number of force over unit distance. So M1, M2 by R cube. And that is the reason since moon is 384,000 kilometers away, and sun is 15 crore kilometers away, moon wins. A lot of our teachers have never told us, sun also attracts the water on the earth. Do you know how much 47% than the moon does on a small amount? Suppose I'm standing on a geographical location and moon is above me. So as I am going around, as the earth is going around, I, I, I will come back to the same spot nearly after 24 hours. By that time, moon may have shifted a little bit to my respect. So roughly after 24 hours, I should expect another high tide. But there are two high tides. I mean, why? Because if I'm standing somewhere and the moon is above me, there are two forces working on the water body here. One is the force of gravitational attraction to the, towards the moon. What is the centrifugal force? And the force of gravity is more than the centrifugal force. So water bulges towards the moon as if and I see a high tide. But just 180 degrees away from me, on the other side of the globe, it is a centrifugal force which become more than the gravitational force. As a result, water bulges in that direction. So next time you go to the Ganges or Lilua is nearby to the Ganges, 
you see a high tide, you tell yourself, I was, as I'm seeing this high tide now, at this very point of time, in the rivers of Mexico, high tides are. That's the reason two high tides are. Moon, beautiful picture, beautiful. Taken from near the surface of the moon, the earth arising from the horizon. What is moon? According to 99% of the scientists, 4.52 billion years back or 452 crore years back, a huge ball of rock came and slammed onto the earth with such a force, huge amount of surface material got gouged up and was thrown up into space. Going to a very far, vast distance, it condensed, coagulated, coalesced, collided, and ultimately gave birth to earth. This theory, which goes by the name collision ejection theory, or sometimes the giant impacted theory, is believed by all the scientists most or less. There are three other theories. Co-creation theory, capture theory, fission theory. But as I told you, 99% of scientists believe in this theory. And what happened because of this collision? Two things. Forever, Earth got tilted by 25 hours. Accident. And the passive, today's Pacific Ocean was created. Let us begin our journey out of our earthly bounds into the space and time. Why am I saying space and time? I already mentioned about Albert Einstein's concept. Right? But you also know that light has a velocity, three lakh kilometer per second. The distance between sun to earth is 15 crore kilometer. Velocity of light is three lakh kilometer per second. If you do a simple division, any class six, seven, eight geography textbook will give you the fact that the distance from sun to earth is 8.3 light minutes, or light takes 8.3 minutes to come from sun to earth. What does it basically mean? It means when tomorrow the sun rises, you get up and look at the sun for a fraction of a second, you have to tell yourself, the sun that I'm seeing now, it is the image of the sun as it was 8.3 minutes back and I'm seeing it now. Closest star, Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away. If today evening if the sky is clear, look at it with a binocular and tell yourself the star I am seeing now, it is the image of the star as it was 4.2 years back and I'm seeing it now. So my friend, next time your younger brother or sister tells you, Dada or Didi, please take me to the science city, spend 50 bucks on a time machine ride, never. On a clear night, go out into the open, tilt your head. The deeper you are seeing, you are seeing your own past. We don't realize that we do an instantaneously time travel the moment we look up into the sky. The first stop of our journey, cosmic journey, is obviously the solar system. This is almost the true color of all the major planets made of stars of the solar system. Sun, then Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, even as a Neptune. Poor Pluto has been kicked out sometime back. Sun. Sun is a ball of gas, right? You all know. My friends, tell me, if you have a football, pump in a lot of colored gas, cut open the football, will the gas remain like a ball inside? It will diffuse out. Then how come sun being a ball of gas is not diffusing out with the sun? What does the scientist say? According to the scientist, 460 crore years back, there was a huge cloud of gas and dust floating in space. The in terms of number of particles, the cloud was made up of 91% helium, a hydrogen, 8% helium, and 1% rest other elements. And in terms of mass, 74% hydrogen, 25% helium, and 1% rest other elements. The average temperature of this gas cloud was minus 240 degrees centigrade. At minus 240 degrees centigrade, out of the four fundamental forces of nature, only one type of force comes into play, and that is the force of self-gravity. The force of self-gravity will attract the periphery of this gas cloud towards the center. As the gas goes towards the center, the central density rises. As the density builds up, pressure builds up. As the pressure rises, temperature rises. And starting from minus 240 degrees centigrade, the temperature rose to a fascinating level of 1.5 crore degree centigrade. And at that temperature, four hydrogen nuclei, as if they come together, fuse together, and produce a helium nucleus. This hydrogen to helium thermonuclear fusion reaction produces huge amount of energy. On Earth, they are used to explode as a hydrogen bomb. But inside the sun, in a very regulated manner, 
when four hydrogen nuclei goes to onto a helium nucleus, huge amount of energy is produced. That energy tries to come out from the central region, produces a back pressure or radiation pressure outside. And this radiation pressure, when it exactly balances and matches the inward force of gravity, sun being a ball of gas, remains hanging there for millions of years. So you and me exist now. Again, is because of two forces exactly canceling each other every second of our existence in an object 15 pro million, 15 pro kilometers away from us. If you bring down the sun to your lab or to your home, cut it open like a watermelon, inside there are three regions. The very central region where the thermonuclear fusion reaction is going on is called the core. And the energy that is produced on the core for a huge volume, it freely flows. It is called the radiative zone. And sun is funny looking. From the surface up to a depth of 650 to 700 kilometers, columns, pillars of gas stacked one after another. Heat comes from inside, hits the bottom layer of the gas pillar. Gas, when it is heated, will rise up, comes to the surface, deposits the heat as sunlight, becoming cold like a fountain, continuously goes down and raises the heat from inside. It is called the convective zone. Outward, the sun is again divided into three regions. The surface of the sun that you get to see in the early morning or evening, it is called the photosphere. Over the photosphere in a very thin layer, exquisitely pink colored spikes of gas can be seen called chromosphere, chroma means color. And for hundreds, thousands of kilometers, a milky white radiation called corona. Yes, you know, corona means crown in Latin. That is the only relation with coronavirus, just the look. But this solar corona, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. Milky white radiation streaming out from the surface of the sun. This is an actual picture of the surface of the sun. Photosphere. Pillars, these are cell-like structure. Each is the top part of a pillar of gas. As the heat is coming through the central region, is lighted. The moment this comes on the surface, deposits the heat goes down. In the outer boundary layer of these cells, the temperature is less and goes down. Typically 950 to 1000 kilometers in diameter. And this is an amazing picture of the chromosphere. But during a total solar eclipse, just beyond the photosphere, visible disk of the sun, spikes of gas. And one of the most breathtaking, beautiful, amazing, exciting picture of nature, solar corona. Amazing. Sometimes suns become very active. You get to see black spots, call it the buzz, called sunspots, shoura kalang, what are they? The surface temperature of sun is 5,600 degrees centigrade. At that temperature, gas cannot remain as gas. It becomes what is known as plasma. Plasma has a property. Wherever there is a magnetic field, the plasma will try to get deflected from it. On the surface of the sun, very randomly, small pockets of magnetism will form. A column of plasma trying to bring the heat from inside. If it realizes that there is a magnetic field above, it will not come out straight. It will take the heat away from different directions. No heat comes out from that region. It typically looks dark and is called a sunspot. Don't think sun is a very smooth, like an egg yolk, yellow orange object as we see in the early morning or late evening. Just to give you an idea, this picture costed the US government, the taxpayer, $1.2 billion. Billion, not million. Sun is not a smooth object. Tremendous amount of explosions are happening every second, almost, on the surface of the sun. Thousands of tons of gas are getting thrown up from the surface of the sun, making beautiful arch and loop falling back onto the surface. Sometimes they get thrown up with such a force they get detached from the surface of the sun and flow past over the whole solar system like a solar wind or solar storm. The next picture is an actual picture. See for yourself. Do you know what is the size of this cavity? Arch, a cavity inside the arch. Three earth will go side by side inside this cavity. My friend, 
morning it gets up, evening it goes down, taken for granted, tomorrow again it will come up. But it is one of the most dynamic, most violent, most at to the level of our, our understanding, unpredictable. Anything can happen to that respect. And these charged particles, as they come and hit the earth, everything should be destroyed. But we are alive. How? Again, by a sheer accident. By almost an accident, earth behaves like a bar magnet. Right? Like the peels of an orange, there is an invisible magnetic shield. This charged particle, they come and slam onto the magnetic shield, cannot enter through, throw past the earth. And we think we are the king and queen of ourselves, you know. We are the best of the law. But if you remember your childhood days, drawing the magnetic lines of force of a bar magnet, in the north and southern magnetic polar region, there is as if a gap. These charged particles, they do enter the Earth's atmosphere through this gap. Before hitting the ground, probably destroying everything and everybody, they interact with the air molecules and make them glow. And what we get to see? Aurorids. Aurora borealis in Northern Hemisphere, Aurora australis in Southern Hemisphere. And let me tell you, my friend, it is a mind-blowing experience. I, mean, I have been, I've seen it, I was lucky to see it twice. Northern part, northernmost part of Norway, but it's an amazing experience. Solar system, how did it happen? According to the scientists, 450 glorious years back, when from the disk of gas and dust, our sun was getting born in the central part of the disk. In the outer periphery, where the temperature is less, gas and dust condensed, coagulated, coalesced, and ultimately gave birth to all the planetary system. Rather, they gave birth to very hot spherical objects. For millions of years, the heat got dissipated out. And at least the first four, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, became rocky, terrestrial, whereas the other four, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are mostly made up of gas. Amazing. This is a collage of all planets, true color pictures. First is Mercury. Next is Venus. You do not get to see the surface of Venus covered by a thick layer of cloud. The cloud is made up of concentrated sulfuric acid vapor. The atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide. As a result, the greenhouse effect is so critical, it being the second planet is still the hottest planet of the solar system. Next is our mother Earth. Let us not talk about her tonight. Next is the red planet Mars. Why red? It is rusting on the surface. Ferrous and ferric oxide covers the whole surface. But this 2002 photograph taken by Hubble Space Telescope has interested the scientists because they have found white sediments in the north and southern magnetic uh, polar region. According to them, these white sediments is a mixture of water ice, dry ice, that is carbon dioxide ice, maybe a little bit of ammonia ice. So to them, even if a part of it is water ice, maybe in the past, liquid water used to flow on the surface of Mars. And liquid water on life on Earth means life. So was there life on Mars? Is there still life on Mars? Big question. Next is Jupiter. 319 times more massive than Earth. Takes 11.86 years to go around the sun once, but takes only 9.5 to 10 hours to go around itself. With the tremendous spinning speed, it has dragged the clouds of the atmosphere and created this belt-like structure. It has more than 80 moons, satellites. Next is the beauty of the solar system, Saturn. Absolutely beautiful. Fantastic rings. Takes 29.4 years to go around the sun once and has more than 80 moons also. Uranus, yes, with the ring. Neptune, blue in color, covered by methane wearing clouds. And our Nanne, Munne, Pluto, with three of his major moons, Sharon, Nix, and Hydra. Mars. I think the day you are born till today, almost regularly, you are hearing news about Mars. Either going to Mars or discoveries in Mars or discrepancies in Mars, in Mars, right? All these YouTube imaginary challenge channels, not imaginary humor mongers. I have seen life. There is something on Mars. Absolutely not. But naturally, there is life. 
these sort of channels tells us probably liquid water has cut through the mountainous region and created these cracks. 2008, Phoenix landed onto Mars among a lot of instruments in a robotic arm. On 20th day of operation, as it scratched a little bit, it found a white sediment. See for yourself in the inset, three white, whitish fields from here. After four days, was not seen. Were not seen. This is the first time the human civilization have found proof of water ice outside the boundary of water. This picture takes the cake. Right? It's the side wall of a crater on Mars. This is summer, same place winter. Again, summer. You see the black streaks? Liquid water was found floating on the surface. Immediately, the scientists realized we have to find out deeply about it. Because if there is life, if there is microorganisms, they can affect the life on Earth. Believe me, the way coronavirus is affecting, you can make out a smallest, smallest, smallest entity can change the direction of human civilization. Right? If three years back somebody would have said it, said this thing to you, you should have started laughing and making jokes. But today, we all do. So, we have to know about Mars. 2012, Curiosity landed onto Mars. The first set of pictures it showed, sent to us, amazing, dried up riverbeds. Pebbles, which can only occur if there is, sometime back there was a flow of water, the stones getting smashed with each other, becoming smaller, getting smoothened by the flow of water. This tells us that definitely there was liquid water, the liquid waters sometime back on Mars. And when the whole world was excited to do something about it next, 15th of August, 2012, on the Independence Day of India, the then Prime Minister declared in the Lok Sabha, India is ready for a mission to Mars. Believe me, my friends, throughout the world, all the scientists, as if they started laughing. Our best friend, closest friend, China. Xinhua News Agency, the biggest news agency of China, published a, published a notice next day, an article. The Indian space scientists are ready to prove themselves as clowns and jokers in front of the world community. That was the heading. You know the story. 5th November 2013, sitting atop a nose cone of a PSLV X-25 rocket, Mars orbiter mission and Mangaljaan was sent onto space. And on 24th of September 2014, at 8.02 a.m., India became the first country in the world in its first attempt successfully entered Mangaljaan on an orbit around Mars. No country till today has been able to do it on the first instance. And the cost was amazingly low. Amazing. 460 crore rupees. So, oh my God, India, poor country, 460 crore rupees. My friends, at that time, the population of India was 115 crores, 460 crore. So it is four rupee per person. The cost of your tiffin in a particular day can cross 500, 500, right? But four rupees per person. All of us think in a very biased way that, oh, it is so difficult. You no, know, you need money, you need manpower, you need proper environment. If you can produce yourself, your parents, us, everybody, a proper environment for studies, you can achieve success. Not fighting, political gimmicks, right? soap operas on television channels. Continuous IPL matches 
where money is the only deciding factor, not the cricket. How many times you have gone abroad with your parents? How many malls do you visit every week? How many games you play on the computer? How many friends you have in Facebook? How many posts you give about your riches, about your successes on Facebook? Doesn't improve our society. It improves only one thing, your own image and which gets shut down the moment you are asked to do something very serious and if you fail. So what you do defines who you are. Howsoever nice photographs you give on your Facebook, howsoever cool dude or a wonderful girl you are, beautiful girl you are, does not make any sense in terms of progress, in terms of development, in terms of the reality of life. At your young age, you should understand. Your school is a fantastic school. But I know private institutions in the city, anywhere, some, a section of students, they feel so proud that they are part of this school. They're arrogant. Oh, the other school, right? The government school. Poor fellows. Parents don't have money. They don't have proper dresses. What they teach, what they learn. But believe me, in India, most of the successful scientists and technocrats at present are from those schools, not your or mine. We have believed that if I, by the age of 20 to 23, if I've started earning quite large, of money because my parents have invested in nine private tutors for 10 subjects. Lakhs of rupees for an engineering or a medical or something or some course. Everything in life. And I became successful by earning money by age of 2023, 20, getting a flat, getting my second car, the latest model, and successful. Absolutely not my that is a very wrong portion of life, success in life, believe. Though our society will try to make you believe. Like these advertisements, they tell you a particular brand of toothpaste is the best for every person. In the world. Similarly, our, even our academic system, even our society will tell you what is best for you. Don't, because you are young, don't get involved into a sense of mediocrity, celebration of mediocrity, religion, political biasness, individual wishes of powerful people. They will try to guide you, your life, but build up your own knowledge, conscience, actions through your studies, through your understandings, talking to yourself. And that will bring you success. As India, being a poor country, Ganga Sagar and Kumbh Mela and Sanyasis and Kau and this and that and politics and corruption. But don't forget India. Have that picture up. From two-dimensional photographs, three-dimensional topography can be created. This year it is quite nice. Three satellites have reached Mars. Two of them has landed. Perseverance with a small drone helicopter ingenuity on 18th of February. Tiananmen One from China reached orbit of Mars on 10th February and has landed its rover. And Amal from United Arab Emirates went was launched on 9th of February. And the scientists have marveled. First flight of a man-made machine on the atmosphere of a distant planet, Engineer. ISRO is primed for success. Tremendous achievement. Chandra Jantri 
Mangal Jan 2, Lunar Polar Exploration in collaboration with Japan. Aditya L1, probably this year sometime will be launched. Shukrayan for Venus and Indian Space Station. And I don't know how many of you know, by 2023, a crude meaning astronauts will be floating in space from an Indian spacecraft, which will come back to Earth. Yes. You don't have to think of earning millions of dollars and giving it to Elon Musk to go on to space. India is getting ready for that. Saturn, feel like 84,000 kilometers wide ring but only one to 100 kilometers in thickness. See in comparison with the size of Earth. And what is the ring made up of? Amazing, ice crystals and pebbles. How come ice crystals and pebbles are not getting dissipated? Keeping the shape and size going round Saturn in a very orderly fashion is an amazing fact. And you all know the stories, right? Yeah. If you are near the rings of Saturn and you meet an alien, I do not know whether there is at all an alien. A hyper imagination, right? And the alien asks you, who are you? You are alone in the Saturnian ring system. What will you answer? You cannot say, I am a human being. What does a human being mean? There is no other human being. So what you have to probably say, sir or ma'am, whatever the alien is, uh, me, 7.8 billion existence like me, Billions of other forms of life, all oceans, seas, rivers, mountains, forests, trees, everything is concentrated in this small pale blue dot. We are all a micro dot in that. That is my universe. But imagine an earth in your family, among your friends, in your housing society. In the cl parties, clubs, how important each of us feel right now. But from a cosmic distance, you are just smaller, smaller, smaller than speck of dust. That is the most humbling feeling. 1801, Italian astronomer Joseph Piazza discovered a piece of rock 900 kilometers in diameter named it Sere. People thought a new planet has been discovered. But within a couple of years, three more, Pallas, Vesta, and Juno, each around 500 kilometers in diameter were discovered in the same region between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter going around the sun. People realized a new class of object is getting discovered. And starting from 1801 till today, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 pieces of rock, 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 kilometers have been discovered between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter going around the sun. They are called asteroids. The next picture is a true representation of NASA. Here, each green dot is a discovered asteroid. And the red dots are called special name, Apollo asteroids. Why, what is the speciality? Their orbits intersects the orbit of Earth. That means Earth is going on the sun and nicely. Any one of them can come and bang onto the Earth at any point. If you ask me, when can that happen, my God? can happen just now as I'm giving this lecture, really. It can happen 10 years later. It can happen 10 lakh years later. Nobody knows. And if it banks on now, even one fifth, one sixth, one seventh of the earth will go up. Forget about the earth. Fraction, fraction of a second, poof, evaporated. Intense heat. So that we are alive is an accident. Take that into don't take anything for sure. And spacecraft has landed onto one of these asteroids called Ryogu and sent back not only images, even some sample, because people believe there can be rich mineral deposits on the surface of the asteroids, which can be mined and brought back to Earth for the development of the human civilization. Comets and more than important nine planets in the solar system. Starting from 1998, astronomers using a big telescope, as they are looking into the farthermost corner of the solar system, they started discovering newer and newer objects going around the sun. Funny names today, 
Sedna, Kwawar, 2004 DW. And in 2003, they discovered this object. Initially named as 2003 UB313. Now the official name is Eris, E R I S, right? Larger than Pluto. At the point of discovery, 1600 crore kilometers away from Sun. It takes 557 years to go around the Sun once. Scientists started debating. Because it is larger than Pluto, if you're calling Pluto a planet, why can't you call these objects a planet? There was a tremendous debate. And ultimately, in 2006, after a lot of discussions and deliberations and factorization of the laws, planetary laws, properties, Pluto was demoted to dwarf planet. A new class of object was nomenclature. Eight classical planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Then dwarf planets or Pluto, poor Pluto, then Navagraha got demoted to dwarf planet. The largest asteroid, Sere, and this newly discovered object in 2003, Eris, they became the dwarf planets. In 2015, two more dwarf planets have been officially acknowledged by the supreme body of astronomy and astrophysics in the world called International Astronomical. Union, headquarters in France, in Paris. And I'm an associate of that. And whatever they say, everybody has to follow, right? Out of the solar system. These are all true color pictures. If you go out of the solar system, you will say, what nonsense. When I look up into the sky in the evening, two stars far between and totally dark in between. That's from you're getting this photograph. Do you know why we don't get to see these photos, photographs to our eyes, images, why? The problem is with the human eyesight. Human eyesight has something called perception of vision. Within one tenth of a second, whatever amount of light enters through our pupil and falls on the retina, the optic nerve immediately takes them to the back of our head to create an image. Our eyes cannot integrate light like a sesame chip, right? And that is the reason if our eyes were like a sesame camera, a sesame chip, looking in a particular direction in the sky, but 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 hours, you should have seen every point in the sky, there is a star. And huge gas clouds of all hues, colors, and saturations. Are all the stars like sun? Answer yes, sir. Yes, and why yes? Because most of the stars, 91% of the stars are burning hydrogen to helium at the center. Why no? Because stars come with different initial mass, different surface temperature, and different chemical compositions. In terms of mass, stars can come in the range of 0 0.08 to 150 times the mass of sun, where the mass of sun is 2 in 10 to the power 30, or 2 followed by 30 zeros, so many kilograms. In terms of surface temperature, stars can come in the range of 50,000 degrees centigrade to 1,800 degrees centigrade. And it was a legendary woman 110 years back at the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, Mary Jump Cannon, examining the image and spectrum of 2,40,000 stars through naked eyes, classified the stars. In seven years of her research, you know how many holidays she took? Seven days. Yes. What we do? How many holidays this year? Oh, how many holidays is getting wasted for Saturday, Sundays? Right? That is called science. That is called research. 100 years, science have changed, but nobody could, can touch a classification star. The hottest surface temperature star, let, it call it, let us call it O star. Next hot, B star, A star, F star, G star, K star, and M star. Sun with a surface temperature of 5,600 centigrade is a G type of star. That brings me in this introductory level to the life and death of stars. A fascinating story, my friend. Stars are born from interstellar clouds of gas and dust. In the sky, there are regions where one can see these clouds and also star formation processes. Do you want to see true color pictures? Which I am sure you have seen it in Facebook and uh, whatever, YouTube and all sorts of websites. Let me see. True color picture. From one interstellar cloud, 1,000 solar system can form. Don't mix it with the cloud in our skies. That is the third planet that was 
You want to see the excitement. 2.5 million pixels. Each pixel gives you a story. Top, greenish blue, oxygen five, oxygen six. Blue, neutral hydrogen, yellow, sulfur, black, iron, green, zinc or molybdenum, white, titanium. A picture tells a story. Do you know how tough is astrophysics? Let me tell you. Not only rosy pictures, right? Looking at a photograph of your friend or somebody, can you tell what is his or her age? What is her weight? How long ago he was born? He or she was born? What is his body temperature? What is his chemistry of the body? How organs are working? What is the meaning of life? Can you tell? They are looking at just a photograph. No, right? But don't forget, looking at a photograph of a star or this interstellar cloud, you have to define, give every physical. You have to massage the light. Only the signal of light comes from the star or an object of the sky to us. You cannot bring down the star or this cloud onto your lab, cut it open, put chemical, test it, smell it, and say, aha, this is this. You have to be tremendously positive and intelligent upstairs. Tremendous. It's not easy. One of these photographs can produce 10 to 12 PhDs, each of them working for four to three and a half to four years to understand just one photograph. So, oohs and ahs, humongous, absolutely mind boggling. So cool. All these you know, exclamatory marks when we see it in internet. But don't forget, hundreds and thousands of very intelligent, serious people, some of them young, and quite a number of them from India, night and day, night and day, they try to understand the cosmos. See for yourself. How big is this? You see in the top, the circle one, one, two, three globules. Do you know what is the actual size of each of these globules? Each globule inside is hiding a fully formed solar system. Universe is throwing a challenge to your mental evidence. You know, you, you know, you feel that you know everything, right? Try to understand. Then talk, talk. then shout, then promote yourself. And tell to the world, I am invincible. Understand. If you are born, you have to die. Stars die in different ways depending upon their masses. Stars whose initial mass is one to eight times the mass of sun. For example, take sun. How will it die? It is burning hydrogen to helium, producing energy. That's why it is alive. How much hydrogen remaining at the central core of the sun? Scientists through small calculation have showed for another 500 crore years, sun will be burning hydrogen to helium. After 500 crore years, when all the hydrogen in the central region gets transformed to helium, the thermonuclear fusion reaction will stop, energy production stops, outward pressure stops, but gravity is there, sun will shrink. As it shrinks in the outer layer, in the outer periphery, there is still a lot of hydrogen remaining in the shell region. Because of contraction, the gravitational contraction, the temperature rises to 1.5 crore, which earlier was the, center, the temperature of the core. And at that temperature, the shell hydrogen will start fusing to helium. Huge amount of energy will be produced. Heat, gas when heated, loads up, expands. So sun, after 500 crore years later, opening the window and looking at it, you'll see sun becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Suddenly it will halt and start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. How big it will be? In a small calculation, it can be shown. After 500 crore years later, sun will become bigger and bigger and bigger and ultimately touch the orbit of the Earth. Yes, Mercury, Venus, and Earth will all go inside the sun much, much, much before that. Forget about light. When this is happening the inside, the helium ball, because of gravitational contraction, temperature rises from 1.5 to 10 crore degrees centigrade, which is enough to fuse helium to carbon. Helium to carbon production takes place. Again, heat is generated inside contraction stops. But soon, when all the helium gets transformed into carbon, since the initial mass of the star was one to eight times the mass of the sun, it is not enough that at that stage to put more gravitational pressure to increase the temperature to 1,000, 10,000 crore degrees centigrade. 
because at that those high temperature trillion trillion degrees centigrade other elements to form so inside will be a hot ball of carbon in the sky very bright dot will be called a white dwarf by that time the outside has become so big it slowly creates a cloud like nebula structure called the planetary nebula nebula the word nebula means cloud for billions of years the planetary nebula will get dissipated in the atmosphere of the star and the white dwarf continuously giving out energy will become cold and will become white from white a brown or a black dwarf and will never be able to see it again for the last 30 years very small very small uh, not much mentionable research me and my collaborators have done we have shown that when the star is becoming big the envelope is becoming big it produces shock waves and the shocks through a very very complicated process and i had to write the code in 1996 24000 line fortran program now there is nothing called fortran right but what there is but nobody uses that python the uc++ whatever one year supercomputer i was a faculty at that time at university of manchester we showed that the shocks moving at typically a speed of mach 5 or mach 8 mach is a speed of sound can produce molecules behind the shock so when he wrote it wrote it up as a paper sent it to publication nobody did but luck 97 holland sent a spacecraft called iso infrared space observatory within 6 months of operation out of the 72 molecules you have predicted out of our simulation 68 that discovered a very exciting branch astrochemistry and these are the molecules that has been discovered and predicted by us most of them are organic molecules so my friend life is an universal process not particular to earth god has not given if there is one only life to earth don't feel yourself say I don't get it when people become so white tighty throughout the day they shout they do bad things corruption cheating and in the evening do a little bit of puja and thinks everything is fine and easy and easy if i can afford i will spend 1000 rupees for a quick darshan of a very famous idol or deity and the poor people they will queue up for 3 hours right I have money, and you are talking to God. What a hypocrisy! Amazing. I earn one lakh rupees per day by mostly doing business or cheating, and in the evening I spend ten thousand rupees on a puja and think, "Aha!" So nothing wrong. We forget life is an universal thing, not. Only particular to me, to human beings. Right. Stars whose initial mass is eight to twenty-five times the mass of Sun. How will they will die? Hydrogen to helium initially, then helium to carbon. But the mass is more, so more pressure. Carbon to oxygen to neon to sulfur, silicon, ultimately iron. Iron has the highest binding energy. You cannot put pressure or temperature and fuse to iron nuclei. As a result. When iron is reached at the center, the thermonuclear fusion reaction stops. The inside of the star, the very central region of the star, takes the shape of a peel of an onion. Right? Hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, and then the inert iron. When this stage is reached, because there is no outward pressure, radiation pressure, gravity is always there, so the star shrinks. All this layer starts to fall towards the center. The poor iron filler has no heart to go. It becomes incompressible. Nuclear density gets a kick, recoil, and all these layers start coming up and meets the further layer still on the process of falling towards the center. Tremendous amount of an implosion, which generally we call an explosion, supernova explosion. For a fraction, fraction of a second, at the point of explosion, the temperature can rise to trillion, trillion, trillion degrees centigrade. And starting from iron fifty-six to ninety-four in the periodic table, all the naturally occurring elements get produced in a fraction of a second. Since fraction of a second, not much can be produced. 
and on Earth they have a special name, rare Earth element. Uranium, polonium, thorium, the amount you get, very small compared to other basic elements. And my friend, these elements get thrown up into interstellar space. New stars are born, newer generation stars are born from this interstellar medium. Some of these elements, they get involved in the nebula, which gives birth to the star and the planets. And when you ask yourself the question, a single atom of iron in your blood, where from it has come? Through your food? How in the food? If you are a vegetarian from the plant, if you are a non-vegetarian from the goat, and goat has eaten the plant. How in the plant it has come? From the soil. How in the soil it has come? Because my friend, scientists have shown at the birth of the universe, which goes by the name Big Bang Hypothesis, only two elements are produced, hydrogen and helium. You should realize today, each atom of iron in your body, in your blood, each atom of calcium in your bones, sodium, potassium, magnesium, zinc, whatever your body, your computer, your house, your clothes are made up of, atom by atom, literally were created millions of years back inside a star. And in true sense, not philosophy, not poetry, not literature, we are star children. We are made up of star dust. Everything. That is the biggest connection that, that we can have with the stars. And the inside, the iron core, because of tremendous shrinking, most elementary particles get transformed to neutrons, and they are called neutron stars, which are spinning very fast. Or from the magnetic polar region, beams of charged ionized particles will come out, produce radiation. And if those beams cut our line of sight, we get to see what are called pulsars. So you see, starting from gas, ending up to gas, both small mass stars, medium mass stars. I'm telling you, all the elements of the periodic table, naturally occurring elements apart from hydrogen and helium, were produced in astrophysical scenarios. And they make a tremendously complicated chemistry of space, which goes on to answer when people ask, how did life originate? It is difficult to produce life on Earth at the very first time. So life, probably prebiotic forms of life, not aliens, prebiotic forms of life came to Earth through these collisions at the initial stage of meteorites and comets and cosmic dusts. So a new branch, astrobiology. Astrophysics, astrochemistry, astrobiology, astrostatistics, astromathematics, how much do you think one subject can be? Death of stars, mysterious kind. Stars whose initial mass is more than 25, initial mass, more than 25 times the mass of sun. How will they die? Scientists theoretically showed that because of the gravity becoming tremendous, it will not explode, not happen as a supernova, but it will contract and contract and contract and ultimately become as if a small dense point with infinite density, which is called the singularity. Because of infinite density, it will attract all the objects nearby in the periphery towards it by gravity. And the, the, the gravitational potential is so large, even light particles, photon cannot come out, and the, no light will come out, and we cannot see them, let us call it black holes. But too much of a scientific fiction kind of thing. That there's the there the genius of Einstein lies, who showed every object in space because of its mass, space and time, we create a curvature. And in this scenario, which is called the Einstein's equation, G mu nu gives all the curvatures of every object in the whole universe is proportional to T mu nu. T mu nu is the mass and energy density of everything one of the most elegant, beautiful equations, geometry versus mass and energy. So gravity is a property of the geometry of space-time. And in this concept, if you now think a small point like entity with infinite density is placed in your space-time as if there is a funnel, visualize 
fourth dimension you cannot visualize. We cannot visualize three dimensions. Do you know that? You'll say, what? Three dimensions we know? No, we only see surfaces. Right? We, we imagine the third dimension. So it is very difficult, but visualize that as if in the space and time, there is a hole, every object nearby, if attracted, falling through the neck of the hole, will never come out, even light cannot come out. Space-time singularity of black hole. And this neck area, that if an object slides through that, reaches the infinite potential, P potential, will never come out. Even light cannot come out. This region is called the event horizon. It's a one-way imaginary membrane. And how will you see a black hole if no light is coming out? You can see indirectly, if there is two binary stars, one become a black hole, because of its tremendous gravitational attraction, it will attract the gas of the other star. But the gas from the other star will just not go straight and fall because it has to lose its angular momentum because every star is spinning. So it goes round the so-called black hole event horizon and ultimately goes out, cross the event horizon. But as it is going round and round, going closer closer to the event horizon, because of the tremendous speed and fric friction, tremendous amount of X-rays will be produced. And you can see an accretion disk of X-ray material, mostly in other lights also, without anything inside. And you know there is a black hole. Till today, about 40 stellar black holes have been identified. But there are black holes of much bigger dimension, not 1, 10, 20 solar mass million times, billion times the mass of sun. And people believe they reside at the central part of our galaxy or any galaxy. Our galaxy is called the Milky Way. 200,000 crore stars. One end to the other end, one lakh light years. Just sun is a very old, very mundane, very simple star. But scientists, for 30 years, they've observed the stellar motion in the central region and discovered a 4 million solar mass black hole, which earned them the Nobel Prize in 2020. And in the distant part, big galaxies at the central part, they have got the picture of the shadow of a black hole, the accretion of a giant elliptical galaxy called M87. So the universe at the largest scale is an here, yeah, each dot is not a star, not a galaxy. And if you go deeper, it's an amazing structures of web-like structure. Four galaxies, filaments, nothing in between points. And we know those objects which we cannot see because they're very far away, because of Einstein's concept of gravity, curvature, a very massive object between a distant object and me, can create a curvature of space and light from those, the distant object, which otherwise would not have entered my eyes because of the curvature of space, will come and, and like a lensing system, it will amplify the light of the very distant object, which either cannot be seen otherwise through a telescope, gravitational lensing, telling us whatever we are missing all these days. Right? Not only that, we know only 5% of matter, ordinary matter, is what we see. But if your theories of universe has to be correct or close to correct, you have to say around 27% of matter is a very amazing amount of uh, amazing particles, objects or dark matter. And almost 70% of whatever remains is what is most still today very sure called dark energy. That one. But scientists through indirect observations have started getting an idea of the dark matter. And they have got a prescription of how starting from our solar system, it is not at the center as the picture says. There is no center on a surface. Three dimension, four dimension, what is the center? Nobody had an idea, has an idea. But here just for pictorial reasons, think that you are in the center. As you go out and out and out, you will see structures, you will see cosmic waves, ultimately you'll come to a surface beyond which you do not know, you will never do wrong forever. And beyond that is a singular point, the understanding of our present generation of scientists, the universe started from a singular. 
called the Big Bang. 13.77 billion per second. So you see, my friend, universe is open. Absolute beauty, absolute wonder, excitement, awestruck. Whatever studies you do, commerce, business, MBA, computer science, medicine, law, artist, playing drums, have this wonder in you. Don't forget, we are small, but within this 25 to 30 centimeters, we are tremendously big. We can see this billions of light years, billions of solar mass, enormous amount of time. Succeed in life, utilizing your own potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for opening our minds and broadening our horizons with respect to the prospects of astrophysics and the mystery we call universe. Sir, we'll be open to questions from the audience now. I would request only the students from classes nine to 12 to ask sir any questions if they have. Participants, you can raise your hand in case if you have any query. Dear students or participants, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand. We will ask you to unmute and you can then ask your question. Yes, Swapnendu, you can ask your question. Yes, sir. Sir, good afternoon. Sir, I had a, I had a question regarding uh, the universe. Sir, how can the oldest stars, as we know, sir, there are numerous stars in the universe and some of them are even older than the universe. How can this be possible? At times, there are always this doubt that there are stars whose age is coming out to be the older than the universe. But later on, they have all been resolved. Until now, we are not at the danger of dilemma that how can I have an object which is within a system and it is more aged than the system. So universe is much more older compared to ages of the stars. Even if they have found something, they have corrected, edited the age of the star and made it within the Yes, Abhi. Sir, I have two doubts. Sir, you had that uh, table, no, about that chemical, all the molecules, all the molecules of the organics, uh, all the of the organic chemicals which are formed behind. Sir, can you please open that table? In the last molecule, the last molecule, there was a question mark. Yeah, because the, we are not sure about the molecular structure of that molecule, whether it is stable or not. They form, but they will sort of get again, sort of chemically active and become something else very fast. So that's why, because of the equilibrium of that molecule, there was a question. Okay, so answer one more doubt. Yeah, please. Answer the one next doubt is that we, as you have explained to us, we know that Big Bang at the start of the universe, that is, it, there was only a singularity. Yeah. So, the, so and uh, prior to that, you had also explained that how stars, they uh, eventually, when they become aged, they slowly start to become singular. Like, this slowly start to form singularities. So, is this possible that there was a star that there was a star at the beginning, it then turned into a singularity, and then from yes. that singularity, uh, they not a star, not a star. I, I, I could get the feel of the question. Probably you have also studied a little bit about it, Hawkins and other things, Stephen Hawkins and the concept of singularity there and singularity in the black hole. But it has to be more detailed, more what will I say, researched upon to come to these points of view. But in science, there is one thing, my friend. Thank you for a very good, nice question. It is always good to think that, is it possible? Was it the way it happened? But the answers can come through only rigorous mathematical approach. You have to prove it. Right? That is one. Very, very, very good question. Good. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. 
And sir, what book should I read to follow to like uh, follow your steps and become an astrophysicist? Oh no 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 no! You follow your own steps. You will be much much bigger than the small entity that I am. And internet is the best thing, right? <laughs> one book is only one book, but internet is a million books in your fingertips. That is much better. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. What about this fellow called Meir, M E E R? He was trying to do something, you know, in this chat thing, hundred of chats, just one letter or something, and somebody had stopped him by saying, "Don't do nonsense." Good, whatever. Next question. If students from classes nine to twelve have any queries, they can definitely ask it. Okay, I think after one and a half hours, most of you are exhausted. I am not. Though your age is sixteen, median age mine is sixty six zero. Somehow, this excites you every time I talk about it. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. If there are no more questions, then Ishq. Yes, Sindhu has a question. Oh, okay. Sindhu, you can ask your question. Yeah. Sindhu, unmute yourself. You are muted. Yes, sir. So I was asking that we know that black hole is of a prospective size, and stars are also bigger. But when the uh, when a star goes into a black hole, then sir, where does all that energy goes? See, first of all, a black hole has no size. Singularity is. Uh, if I ask you, how big is zero, or how small is zero, do you have an answer? So singularity is that concept. But there is a region around the star, around the black hole, depending on its mass, which creates this singular membrane called single entry membrane called event horizon. The answer is, if a star, the star will not fall into a black hole like that. The matter will first get attracted, and they, before entering, will go into their elementary particle stage. Ultimately, will become sort of And that energy and speed, mostly energy, and obviously it will increase the mass and energy of the black hole, no doubt. But it was Stephen Hawking's in a, through a process which I'll not tell today. It's a little elaborate. Black holes can evaporate as well, become smaller, shrink also. That's a different story. Rajarshi Chakravarti, Shapendu Dash, Siddhik Siddhik Jana. Yes, Rajeshi, you can ask a question, sir. Uh, um, due to the gravitation, the universe should contract, but then why is the universe expanding? See, universe should be contracting, meaning that the earliest possible answer was universe is expanding, right? But the expansion rate is slowing down. But in 1997, a group of scientists who ultimately got the Nobel Prize showed that the universe is expanding, but not even you know, it is slowing down; it is accelerating. And that they think because of contribution of something which I myself am not very sure what it is is the vacuum energy, dark energy. So there are a lot of ifs and buts. There are a lot of hypotheses, a lot of mathematical construct. But what is the reality? Nobody knows. Next, Shridhar Jana. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Swapnin, do you can ask a question? I think Shridhar Jana has answered this question. Yes, sir. So, what is a white hole? White hole is a mathematical entity. Nobody knows whether they are there, apart from the film Interstellar movie. <laughs> white hole. It's sort of physical reality till now, but a lot of people say the end of a black hole, as if everything is funneled through a white hole. The The, the neck region is called the Einstein-Rosen bridge, mathematically, and any particle going through that bridge will be moving faster than the speed of light. So that means you can go back to your past or something like that. All these stories, are. but mathematically they have been not proven, but mathematically they have been shown the structure. But reality, nobody knows. Yes, indeed. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. please do. So I'm telling that what is behind the black hole? Baba, behind the black hole there is no <laughs> before or behind the black. Okay, if you want to say that I am on the earth, 
and I'm very far, far away, I see a black hole. What is behind that? Behind that, there is normal matter, normal galaxies. You have to understand how close they are to the black hole. If they are very close to the black hole, only then they can feel this curvature and get attracted towards the event horizon. But very, very far away, nobody knows what we do. It is quite normal. How a black hole will have an effect? Very, very, very far away. Right? Definition, uh, according to definition, when you talk about charge and define a charge. So the amount of energy that you spend like bringing that charge from the infinity to that point, nobody knows what is infinity. So these are all approximation and limit. A calculus, you have done limits. That's what it is. I think if there are no more questions, we can just say hello and goodbye. Or Akshay Kumar Shahu can give. I'll take the last question. Akshay, can ask a question? Yes. Sir, uh, like a black hole, can a wormhole exist? I, 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 gave the answer, I, gave, I gave the answer three minutes back. Wormhole can exist, has been shown mathematically to be consistent. But whether they exist, nobody knows. For example, can alien exist? The answer is yes. But have you seen an alien? Or is there any proof that there is alien? No. Possibility and reality. Yes, so uh, you can ask your question. So, Mabu. Yes, sir, I was actually asking, can we really time travel? No, not, not at the level of our existence. At present technology and existence. Okay, sir. Okay, I think we should call it a. Call it a we thank the boys for asking such inquisitive questions to sir, and also sir for clearing all of their doubts. We have now arrived at the most awaited section of today's event: the declaration of winners. The participants were required to send video recordings of their experiments which were judged by our eminent judges. The extreme enthusiasm and dedication with which each participant infused his experiment must certainly have made it quite difficult for the judges to choose one over another. I would request Ma'am Purnima Sanyal to move ahead with the announcement of the winners. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody present here. First, I will congratulate my participants who have taken part in this science exhibition. All of you were excellent, but according to rule of competition, I have to announce few names. Whether you win or lose doesn't matter. You have participated, that is the main thing. Without your participation, science exhibition was not possible. Now I will announce name. First is subject physics, category six to eight. First, Utkars Mishra, 8E. Second, Anish Shinaroy, 8A. Third, Riddhiman Datta, 7D. Now, nine to 12 category. First, Rajorshi Chakraborty, 10D. Second, Shopnil Chatterjee, 12C. Next is chemistry, six to eight category. First, Siddhant Manna, 8E. Second, Iman Chakraborty, 6A. Third, Yatharth Agarwal, 6C. Next is nine to 12 category chemistry. Oshmit Sharma, 9A, and Shonnabo Mitra, 9C, you both will get appreciation certificate. Now, biology, six to eight category. First, Shonendu Pachal, 6A. Second, Debudjoti Nondi, 7D. Third, Aditya Parashar, 8D. Now, nine to 12 category. First, Rishit Ray and Shagnik, De, Shagnik Dash Kanungo, 11C. Second, Orchishman Kumar, 9D. Next is Mathematics, 6 to 8 category. First, 
Niladri Dinda, 8B, 2nd, Atri Joghosh, 7C, 3rd, Priyanshu Anand, 8E. Next is economics, 9 to 12 category. First, Aryan Manna, 11B, and Aradha Dotto, 11B. Second, Ankit Odhikari, 9C, and Shujodipto De, 9B. Next is geography, 6 to 8 category. First, Arush Shaha, 7A. Second, Utkar Shaha, 8D. Third, Ishan Tikadar, 6B. Next is 9 to 12 category. Ornes Jana and Pithiras Dotto, 9B, both 9B. Second, Ayushman Bhattacharya, 9D. Next is computer, 6 to 8 category. First, Devayon Thakur, 7D. Second, Terence Pronoy Jain, 7E. Third, Kusharga Dibedi, 8D. Next is 9 to 12 category. First, Ankon Dotto and Oritro Vishash, 12C, both. Second, Akshay Kumar Shahu and Anoy Kashyap, both 11C. Third, Oritro Bosh, 9B, and Shayok Re, 9C. So I congratulate all the winners. Also, I give thank you to all the participants. Hearty congratulations to all the prize winners. All the prize winners and participants shall be receiving hard copies of the certificates of merit and certificates of participation. Only a handful of participants have been awarded with prizes, but it can definitely be said that each one of us has emerged as a winner today in the truest sense of the word through the experience we have gained. Gratitude is one of the noblest human qualities. It opens up the human heart and carries forward the urge to do something good. May I now invite Sir George Sarkar for delivering the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, respected fathers, respected guest of honor, Dr. Devi Prashad Tuari, my respected colleagues, and my beloved students. It is a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this event of Oceanus Cognitionis. Let me first of all start by giving glory to the Almighty God for making this first ever online science exhibition of Don Bosco School Lelua a resounding success. First and foremost, I thank our guest of honor, Dr. Devi Prashad Duari, that despite his busy schedule, he has found time to grace this occasion. Hats off to you, sir. What a classical way to cover all the topics. There are so many things to learn for every one of us. I wish we could have you offline in our auditorium one day, sir. It would have been great pleasure, sir. I express my heartfelt thanks to Reverend Father Rector, Father Thomas Gomes, and Reverend Father Principal, Father Manod Jos, for allowing us to organize this event in whichever way we wanted. My heartfelt thanks to the entire teaching fraternity of Don Bosco School Lilua, because we received help from all of you. Even though we call it a science exhibition, but we do have commerce with us. The subjects on which we had the exhibits were physics, chemistry, biology, computer, maths, geography, economics, and commerce. So a special thanks to the teachers for choosing and guiding the young minds. I owe special gratitude to the Tech Wing team who gave us the technical support on both the days. I thank all the volunteers of Science Club, the Science Club members, the MCs for the two days, Dr. Shombuddho Mishro, who was our chief guest yesterday, and the parents for their constant support. And last but not the least, thanks to the participants for all their efforts of performing better each and every day. Finally, I thank the Science Club animators, Ma'am Purnima Shannal, Ma'am Anuradha Mal, 
and Mam Sudip Tachodhari for their constant support and guidance. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, sir. With this, we mark the end of Don Bosco Lelua Science Exhibition 2K22. From learning about the vulnerability of life on Earth to discovering the horizons of space, the science exhibition has been an enriching experience for each one of us. It shall certainly evoke a host of memories whenever one recalls it. We hope to return with even greater zeal and enthusiasm the next year. Until then, keep exploring the ocean of knowledge. Who knows what you may find? Thank you. <laughs>